Hey guys, it's Miss Adelini back with a video on DNA structure, so the actual structure of the DNA molecule, and I'm going to try to keep it quick. I'm going to try to keep this under 10 minutes. And we are starting with number 10 on your Unit 6 Notes Packet number 1. Okay, so for number 10, DNA is an example of a nucleic acid. There's only one other type of nucleic acid. It's called RNA, and we're going to learn about that later in the unit. Again, our other three types of macromolecule are carbs, lipids or fats, and proteins. DNA's full name is deoxyribonucleic acid, and while that's a really long term, we're actually going to break it down, and you're going to understand where it comes from later in the video. Um, deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, is made out of single building blocks, or monomers, called nucleotides. And we're going to look at the structure of a single nucleotide and how they link together to make DNA. So you should have filled in numbers 10, 11, and 12 at this point. For number 13, the function of DNA will be to store genetic information. Genetic information is information that's passed down from parents to offspring and determines the traits of that offspring. Let's go to number 14. The two strands within the DNA molecule coil to make what's called a double helix. And we'll go back to the image. This image right here shows the DNA double helix. And it looks kind of like a winding staircase, and it's got two strands that are wrapped around each other. Okay. The sides of those strands are often called the backbone of the DNA molecule. And if I were to uncurl my double helix, it would look like a ladder. The sides of those strands, the sides of the ladder, are made out of two smaller molecules that are bonded to each other. We've got a sugar called deoxyribose, and we have phosphate groups. The sugar is shown as a pentagon because it has five carbons in it. Pent means five. And the phosphate group is always shown as a little circle. Phosphate groups have phosphorus in them, PO form. That's why they're called phosphate groups. So at this point, you should have filled in up through number 15. Number 16 talks about the actual rungs or middle of the DNA ladder. And those are made out of molecules called nitrogen bases. Now, each side of the ladder contributes one nitrogen base, and two nitrogen bases will bond together to form the rungs of the ladder. They bond together using very weak bonds called hydrogen bonds. We'll talk about why that's important. You actually have to be able to unzip or separate the two DNA strands in order to make a copy of the DNA molecule before cell division. These are a couple other ways of viewing the DNA double helix. Here we have the strands wrapping around each other, and here we have it unwound with our rungs of the ladder being our nitrogen bases and the sides of the ladder being um, alternating phosphates and sugars. It's another image of it. Okay. We're going to look at the structure of a single nucleotide, a single building block within one strand of our DNA molecule. Each nucleotide is made of three things, a phosphate group, a five carbon sugar, and then a nitrogen base, or nitrogenous base. Two terms are synonymous. You should have answered number 18 at this point. And number 17 should have come from this image right here. You're going to label a sugar, a pentagon, a phosphate, a circle, and one of these molecules in the middle, a nitrogen base. And again, you're going to list those three parts of the nucleotide under number 18. Number 19 
shows a single nucleotide, I'd like you to label the nitrogen base on the right hand side. It looks like a rectangle in your picture and notice that it has a nitrogen atoms in it, hence nitrogen base. I also want you to label the pentagon as your five carbon sugar, which is deoxyribose. And then the circle is your phosphate group. When you're ready, flip to the next page and number 20. Okay, we call the end of a strand, of a DNA strand, that has a phosphate group on it, this little yellow circle, the five prime end. Phosphate and five start with the same sound, so that's how you can remember which end is the five prime end. So that's the answer to number 20. And then the part of the strand that ends with the sugar is going to be called the three prime end. I don't have a good memory trick for that one, but if you can remember five phosphate, it's a process of elimination. You know the other is going to be your three prime end. All right. What you'll notice when you look at an image of the two strands of DNA is that one strand runs from its five prime end up top to its three prime end on the bottom whereas the other strand goes in the opposite direction. Its three prime end is up top and its five prime end is at the bottom. Number 21 asks you to explain the meaning of the following statement. The strands of the double helix are anti-parallel. Parallel means the strands run next to each other. Anti means they go in opposite directions. Their five prime and three prime ends are in opposite directions. Okay, now let's take a look at the types of nitrogen bases, the rungs of the ladder. There are two bases, adenine or simply A and guanine or simply G, that are large in structure. They're made out of a double ring structure and we'll take a look at a picture of that. Those double ring bases are called purines, whereas our other two bases, thymine and cytosine, are made out of just a single ring, so they're smaller, and they're called pyrimidines. I think it's weird that the larger molecules, the purines, have a shorter name, whereas the smaller molecules, the pyrimidines, have a longer name. Don't know why they did that. So this is what a purine looks like. It's a structure with two rings, whereas the pyrimidine just has one. Okay, purines can only pair with pyrimidines across the DNA ladder. Hydrogen bonds are going to connect those bases together. So you should be up through number 25 with hydrogen bonds. And here you're seeing guanine, one of our purines, bonding with uh, cytosine, one of our pyrimidines. And they don't just use one hydrogen bond to bond to each other, these guys actually use three. Whereas adenine and thymine bond together using two hydrogen bonds. Now number 26 asks you why would it be a problem for the double helix structure if purines paired with purines and pyrimidines paired with pyrimidines. We're going to talk about this in class as well, but um, the reason that that would be an issue is if you had two purines bonded together, you would have four rings across the double helix. Then right below it, if you had two pyrimidines bonded together, you would only have two rings. So you would have a double helix that had an uneven width. That would be an issue for the double helix structure. You want to have purines always bonding with pyrimidines so you can have a constant width of your double helix. Certain bases always pair together across the DNA ladder. Adenine always pairs with thymine. Guanine always pairs with cytosine. And we call that specific base pairing, complementary base pairing, and that's number 27. 
Erwin Shargoff was the scientist who figured out which bases bond together. And he found out that adenine always pairs with thymine and guanine always pairs with cytosine. So that's number 28. He determined that by figuring out the percentage of the four different bases in a single human body cell. He found that in a human body cell, there's about 30% of adenine and thymine. Because there are equal percentages of adenine and thymine, he thought, oh, they must bond together. Wherever there's an adenine, there has to be a thymine on the other side. Same goes for guanine and cytosine. They had approximately 20%. Okay. So you should have answered number 29, and where it says, what do you notice about these numbers, indicate to yourself that adenine and thymine are equal, whereas guanine and cytosine are equal. Okay. Practice question number one asks, if you have 30% adenine, how much cytosine do you have present? So I'm going to go elsewhere. I'm going to go to a Word document right now so that I can do this math problem with you. This is number 30. Unfortunately, I don't have a tablet, so I can't handwrite it out, but I'm going to try to do it by typing, and we'll see how that goes. Okay, so I'll make our font big for you. Okay, and they told us we have 30% adenine, or A, and we want to find out the percentage of the base cytosine. We have to make a series of inferences or assumptions based on what we know about DNA in order to go from what we know, 30% adenine, to what we're trying to find out, the percentage of cytosine. So if we have 30% adenine, we can assume that we also have 30% thymine since adenine and thymine bond together. If we know we have 30% adenine, thirty percent A and thirty percent T, that's a total of sixty percent of all the bases in the DNA being adenine and thymine. That means that 40% of the bases are going to be guanine and cytosine. Our third assumption is that the percent of guanine has to equal the percent of cytosine. So we simply split 40 in half. We divide it by 2, and we get our percentage of cytosine, which is 20%. And our fire alarm is going off, and that's annoying, but I think I'm going to keep going. Okay, so again, I'll take you through the assumptions. We started out knowing we had 30% adenine, so assumption number one says that we have 30% thymine. If we add those two percentages together, we end up with 60% adenine and thymine, which means our other 40% of the bases are going to be guanine and cytosine. If we assume that we have equal percentages of guanine and cytosine, that means we can divide 40 by 2 to determine that we have 20% cytosine and 20% guanine. So I'm going to highlight this as my final answer, 20% for number 30. And I do want you to show the work. Number 31 gives you a sequence of bases on one strand of DNA and asks you to fill in the complementary strand based on what you know about base pairing. Okay, so if this is my original strand, TTA, GC, A, T, G, G, I can fill in my complementary strand wherever there's a T, I'm going to bond it with an A, and vice versa, wherever there's an A, I'll bond it with a T. Wherever there's a G, I'll bond it with a C, and vice versa. Wherever there's a C, I'll bond it with a G. 
So if you know the original strand, it's very easy to determine the complementary strand on the other side of the DNA double helix. So that's your answer for number 31. All right. And I will be back in the next video with a little information about DNA replication. Thank you, thank you.